Hey guys, Dominic here, and we are so glad you are joining with us this morning. As you can tell, things are a little different, so if you are viewing this for the first time or you've been watching uh, these past couple weeks, we would love it if you could go ahead and share this video. That way we can reach more people and get more people connected with Catalyst Church and connected with the name of Jesus. One of the things we love to do as a community is take communion, whether we're meeting physically or online. At the end of the service, someone is going to walk us through communion, and right now is the time to get all that prepared. Whether it's bread or crackers or water or juice, maybe you have some pizza left over or maybe some Sprite, now's the time to get that prepared. While you're doing that, I just want to remind you to keep up to date with everything that's going on at Catalyst. You can check out the hub. That's where you can continue to give and check out the COVID-19 resource page and find out how Catalyst Church is handling all the stuff going on in our world. Again, thank you for tuning in and enjoy the service. Bow before him. Oh, oh, oh. 
know just like any loud mouth say whatever you want type people right and and if you can't think of someone in your friend group that's like that then odds are it's probably you right for me in my friend group it's definitely me like you don't even have to question it's it's for sure me and I think at a young age I must have fallen on my head and, and hit like this social filter and just completely broke it. And it's still in repair, trying to get better, right? Like, you know, the social filter you have where you think something and before it goes to your mouth, like it passes through this filter that says, is that a good thing to say in public? 
most of the time it's like no, and then you don't say it, right? Or it says, yeah, go ahead and say it, and then you say it. Well, for some reason, mine's broke. And so anything that's right up here almost immediately comes out right here. And a lot of y'all have been on the bad end of that. And so I'm trying to get better at it, of course, but there's still some slip ups. In fact, this past week, uh, we've been doing youth group through Zoom and kind of doing these Zoom conferences. And uh, one of our students was on there and he was actually that weekend just at one of his grandparents' funerals. And at one point he comes out of the frame of his camera and, and I said, oh no, where'd you go? Oh, oh, he must have died. As a joke, and you know, hindsight 2020, not really funny. And, and as soon as I said it, I was like, why did I just joke about that? That was such a bad thing. And so you think I would have learned, but I probably made that joke five or six times. And every time I was like, why, why do I keep doing that? And, and I end the chat and I look over at Katie and I said, I couldn't stop myself. I just could not, like I had this joke and then it just came out. And like my social filter is completely broke. And when I say broke, I mean like broke, broke. You know, I can think of uh, another guy who has a very broke social filter, and I think that's my boy Peter from the Bible. Now, Peter was one of Jesus' disciples, and Peter was as loud mouth as they come. He would say whatever was on his mind. If something offended him, he would go ahead and say it. If something was outlandish that Jesus said, he would correct Jesus. Like this guy was bold enough to think he could do that. And many times in the Bible, we see Jesus actually rebuking Peter for stuff he was saying. At one point, he even says, get behind me, Satan. Like, shut up, Peter. Use your social filter. Actually start thinking through what you're saying. And at, at one point in the Bible, we see the consequences uh, of, of Peter's social filter actually coming up to bite him in the butt. And so we're actually going to be in John 18. And a little backstory, right before this, uh, Jesus is, is having that last supper with his disciples. And there's a conversation with Peter where he says, Peter, uh, like, you will deny me three times tonight. And Peter's like, no, of course I, of course I won't. And, and Jesus is like, this, this is just what's going to happen. Well, fast forward, we're in the garden. Uh, Jesus is praying and guards come up to arrest him. Now, this is the arrest that ultimately leads to Jesus' death. And, and a few things happen, some crazy stuff happens, but ultimately Jesus is led away by the guards and the disciples disperse, except for Peter and one other disciple. And they follow Jesus kind of in the shadows and ultimately end up in this courtyard. Now, as Jesus is inside on his first trial uh, to, to be killed, Peter is outside with this other disciple and he's confronted first by this servant girl who's watching the gate. And, and this girl says, hey, aren't you, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? And I'm sure nonchalantly Peter's like, no, that's, that's not me. Of course not. You're, you must be thinking of someone else. And, and then we get to another person comes up later in the night. Says, hey, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're one of Jesus' disciples. Like you're one of the guys that follow him around, right? And Peter, I, I imagine getting a little bit more frustrated. No, no, that's not me. Like why, why do people keep thinking that? Like, no, it's not. And then finally a third person comes up and says, no, I know. I know you're one of his disciples. I saw you in the garden when, when he was being arrested. And I'm sure Peter frustrated it even says in some translations that he cursed the idea that he was Jesus's disciple and immediately he hears the rooster crow and, and thinks back to just a couple hours ago when Jesus said you will deny me I, I don't know about you guys but whenever I make a mistake like a pretty big mistake I get this like dropping like in my stomach right and it's, it's almost like nothing's okay everything's really uneasy and I can imagine right now that's exactly how Peter's feeling. I can imagine uh, this, this shame that's weighing down on him, this guilt, this idea, this self-talk saying, I, I can't believe that. You know, it, I, I knew I was gonna fail. I, I can't believe it. I'm, I'm not ever gonna succeed at this. I can just imagine Peter feeling just like garbage, right? And I can think back in my life, like, like I said, when I, when I'm either caught in a sin or, or there's a pinnacle to my sin, I feel this drop. And it just feels like nothing's going to be all right. It feels like, you know, I, I'm not good enough for anything. I'm just living life failure to failure. And, and it sucks. Right? I think a lot of times we just assume people don't feel bad about the sin in their lives. 
right? Like it's easy for us to judge people because we say, oh, they don't feel bad about it. Look how, look how boastful they are in their sinful life or look how happy they are. But I think if we really put ourselves in, in Peter's shoes right now, we would really feel bad about our actions. Like, can you imagine the unbelievable amount of shame? Like, just gut-wrenching, life-altering shame that would weigh on you right now. And I think Peter felt that. And there's been times in my life when I've been stuck in a situation or, or stuck in a sin. And, and it's like day after day, I just feel hopeless, defeated, alone, and like there's really no hope for me. Right? I think all of us at some time, maybe not right now, but at some time, you can think in your lives where we can relate to Peter. Where, like, maybe it's some sin that you've tried to quit, but you're just not strong enough. You can't find the strength. Or maybe it's your relationship track record, right? Like, maybe you just can't find that right guy. You're going from engagement to engagement or marriage to marriage, and, and that guy is just not treating you right. Or maybe it, it's your track record as a father. You feel like you're constantly failing your daughters or your sons. You feel like you're constantly failing your wife or your husband, your friend group, like we can all at some point in our life admit that there's been a moment of hopelessness, of thinking, I'm never going to be better than the sorry piece of crap that I am right now. And Peter gets this. Peter's living there right now, alone, ashamed, depressed, hopeless. And, and some of you are living there right now. And maybe it's not a sin. Right? Like maybe it's not a sin that's holding you down. Maybe it's the possibility of not having enough money in these upcoming weeks or months. Or maybe it's the possibility of like you are already like pretty alone, but now that you're isolated and that there's this social distancing, you feel more alone than ever, more depressed than ever, more suicidal than you've ever felt before. Right? Like it doesn't have to be a sin that takes away hope. It can be just our life circumstances that we're in. And as we sit here with Paul in this self-pity, where do we find this glimmer of hope? Like, where do we go to to see the redeeming qualities of this story? And unfortunately for Paul, it doesn't come for a couple weeks, but let's jump into three chapters ahead, John 21, verses 1 through 7. It says, afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. This is after Jesus died was buried and then rose again. So this is after that. Jesus appeared to his disciples again uh, by the Sea of Galilee, and it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Debedee, Zebedee, and two of their disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into that boat, but that night they caught nothing. So we see Probably a week after Jesus' death or, or Jesus' resurrection, we see Paul, Peter, going back to what he knew. He went back to fishing, right? He had just spent three years with Jesus preparing him for this mission to be fishers of men. And where does he end up a week after that mission goes viral? He's back to where he was. He was fishing with his boys, right? Like that, that's where we find him. So let's, let's just continue. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did that, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say that, like as soon as it clicked for him, he jumped into the water. And he swam to shore. And, and I can imagine this picture right now of, of Peter uh, jumping in, swimming vigorously. It said they were 100 yards away, swimming vigorously to the shore and, and coming to Jesus and just not stopping his running, running up to him, hugging him, soaking wet. And I can imagine Jesus just kind of laughing with joy while Peter is weeping in his arms while holding him. We see Peter jump out unashamedly to get Jesus, almost like it's his first time seeing him. But here's what's interesting. This is not Peter's first time seeing him after Jesus was risen. In fact, Peter saw him two other times before this account. Like between Jesus being resurrected, being back to life, 
and right now, Peter's seen him two other times. And so with Peter being a loud mouth, like say whatever you want type guy, don't you think it would be recorded of Peter saying something to Jesus that very first time that, that he appeared to them? Like, don't you think there'd be something in the Bible that it says, and Jesus appeared to his disciples and, and then Peter got on the floor and started weeping and, and apologizing and saying all this. We don't see any of that, but it records a lot of Peter's stuff. So it makes me think, Here, here's just the picture I see. When Jesus first appeared to them, yeah, Peter probably hugged him and, and loved him. But I imagine Peter probably very ashamed stood in the corner and, and allowed all the other disciples to talk with Jesus. But have you ever had to face your sin? Like a lot of times we do it very ashamed. A lot of times we do it very scared and very nervous. So I can imagine just Peter with this very defensive, defensive uh, position and, and Jesus being in there. So why right now does Peter jump out of the boat and swim to him? If he's already seen him this past week, why does he jump out the boat to see him? And, and I think where we get that, an idea of it is from Luke 5. Right? I'm not going to read that. You can go read it. But basically what happens is before Peter even met Jesus, Peter was out fishing with his boys. Sounds familiar, right? He fished all night and caught nothing. And Jesus said, throw your nets out on the other side. And when he did that, they caught so many fish in that net that the boats began to sink. And other boats had to come in and, and help them out. And they caught so many fish. And so I think when Peter realizes that Jesus is doing this again, it all clicks to him. Right? And what happened right after Luke 5 when, when Jesus first did that miraculous catch of fish? That is when he instated him as a disciple. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so for Peter, everything's clicking now. For Peter, he's immediately taken back to when Jesus first called him. And so for him, when, when Jesus tells him to throw it out and the same exact miracle occurs Peter understands what Jesus is doing. Peter understands that Jesus is calling him back on mission. Jesus is saying, I get that you've messed up. I get that you felt hopeless and depressed and lonely and ashamed, but I'm still here calling you on mission. And what's Peter's response to that? Unashamedly jumping out of the boat, swimming 100 yards and going up to Jesus hugging him and, and I just can see him weeping because it finally clicked Jesus still wants him this is not a moment only Peter is allowed to have this is not just a Jesus and Peter moment this is a moment that we can have whatever sin you're sitting in right now Whatever life situation, whatever depression that you are going through right now is not over. There's still hope for that. There's still a chance to live on mission for Jesus. And, and here's the thing. Last week, Scott preached on uh, that there's, there's nowhere we can go that Jesus can't reach us. Right, And we sang Reckless Love, and it fit just perfectly with this. There's no shadow you won't light up. There's no mountain you won't climb up coming after me. Jesus is coming after you. right? And, and, and that is so encouraging to hear. But I think sometimes, and maybe more times than not, Jesus comes to our shore. And, and there's got to be a reaction from us. right? There's got to be a choice that we make to run after Jesus. And I think it says it perfectly in Jeremiah 29, verse 13 through 14. It says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And it goes on to say, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. It's not enough that Jesus came running after us. It's not enough that Jesus uh, pushed everything aside and, and, and is standing in front of us now. We have to take that step to receive that hope. But he says, I will be found by you, declared the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. There's a lot of people right now that are in captivity to their sin, to their hopelessness, to their oppression, to their, their mental health. There are a lot of people who are in captivity to that. And Jesus came running out and he's standing on your shore 
right now asking you, come be on mission with me. And so whether you've been lost for a long time, right? Whether you have not graced a church building or a church online service for years, or whether you've been a faithful Christian your whole life and just the past couple weeks have been, have been rough, right? And where, wherever you are, Jesus is at your shore right now. You don't have to sit in your self-loathing. You don't have to sit in your shame, in your guilt. You don't have to sit in your defeating self-talk. You don't have to be scared that you're not enough. You just have to jump out of the boat and swim to him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we believe that you are on our shores right now. We believe that no matter how long we've been away from you, you are here calling out to us, calling us on your mission. God, I pray for the people that are watching this right now that, that have lost hope. The people that woke up this morning just defeated, ready to be done, and, and I pray that you will speak your life into them. God, you are a good God and you are able to do amazing things. And we're not scared about this pandemic that's going on. We're not scared about wars that may be happening and, and, and who our leaders are. We're not scared of any of that because you are our firm foundation. God, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to meet uh, even virtually. It's your name I pray. Amen. During our communion time, one of the things we first started at Catalyst was we took it together as a family. And I wanted to get back to that since we are all over the place. So if you would go ahead and grab your communion, whether it's goldfish or crackers or bread or whatever it might be, or even these uh, easy open pouches here, and we wanna go ahead and take this together. You wanna take the bread, and Jesus broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Father, for chasing us down, for being the example, for coming to earth for just one of us but also for all of us. Let us go be about your business this week. In your son's name I pray, amen. Well, that's all we've got for today. Again, we're so glad that you were able to join us. And if you would, go ahead and share this video. Uh, maybe start a watch party of your own so more people can see it. Uh, if you need anything at all, go to our hub at catalystchurch.info. There you can connect with us, you can give online, and you can check out our COVID-19 resource page where you'll see everything that we put out uh, throughout the week during this time. Again, thanks for joining us, and we hope that you guys have a great week.